sociology students. So we're talking about socialization. And one of the first things that we got to talk about is how do you actually become socialized? And there aren't a whole lot of theories on this. But one of the classic sociological explanations of how people are socialized comes from a guy named George Herbert Mead. So we're going to talk about Mead today. He It's kind of good because he only has three steps to his theory of how we become socialized. Okay, so what are they? The first step is the preparatory stage. I'll write that up here for us. Preparatory. I'm going to give you an age range, but remember, this is a sociological theory, which means it's based on human interaction. And so if you get a whole bunch of um, strong socializing interactions when you're really little, you might move through this stage a little bit faster as compared to another kiddo who doesn't have as much strong socializing forces on them. They might socialize a little later, um, but the important part to remember is that it's not really um, important to get through these steps quickly, right? Because this is developing who you are. And if we were all like in a rush to become who we are, uh, then we would all probably be a little bit neurotic and we'd have problems. So it's kind of good that everybody flows through these steps a little bit differently. And we have all the variety that the social world gives us. That's good, right? Okay, so I'm giving you an age range, but remember, this isn't set in stone. This base is based on interaction, which can vary so much, right? So about zero to three is when most little kiddos are in that preparatory stage. What's happening in the preparatory stage? Kids are learning symbols, right? Oh my gosh, when my daughter was little, we, we held up a ball and we were like, ball, ball, ball. We were just trying to get her to understand that spherical objects are called balls, especially if they bounce and shit, right? Then it's a ball. Uh, my older daughter, she um, she called all fuzzy things squirrels, right? And it was so cute because she'd see a cat and she'd be like, squirrel, squirrel. She'd see a dog, squirrel, squirrel, mommy, right? And it was all cute and all until she was about five and she was going to go to kindergarten. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to send her to kindergarten and she's going to call a cat a squirrel and they're going to think I'm like the worst mom ever. So I'm like, we got to straighten this out. We kept working on that preparatory stage, right? Like, no, honey, like squirrels have the big bushy tails. Cats have, you know, long skinny tails. Like we had to get, make sure that she had all those animals straight before we sent her on to kindergarten, right? That's all that work your parents did so that you know all the objects in the world. I have a daughter who has autism. And so she developed a little later um, through these social steps, not surprising, right? Um, because of her autism. And so she spoke a lot later. And one of the... Um, preparatory stage memories that I have is I really wanted her to know that I was her mom. And so every day I'd say, mom, mom. And I'd say, mommy loves you. Mommy cares about you. I'm your mommy, right? And I try to explain what a mommy was and try to get her to give me a little lovin's back, right? And it wasn't until much later than three, but she did finally call me mom. And now she loves me like a mom. So it was uh, so much work, right? Every day to get her to realize that like moms are special and moms love you. But it did eventually pay off. Your parents did similar work or whoever is taking care of you. They were holding objects up. They were teaching you all the words for all the objects in our world. This is a really big social step that we mostly take for granted. Okay, so what's the next step? But that one was so exciting. The next step is the play stage. This is roughly three to six years old. Again, it can vary a lot because this is based on social interaction. The main thing about the play stage is we start to see kiddos engaging in role-taking behaviors. So they start, they know what a mommy is. They've learned that in the preparatory stage. So now they try to be a mommy. They play, they role play being a mommy or being a mechanic or being a farmer or being, you know, kids, they love that imaginary play, right? And it's because they've just figured out what everything in the world is, right? And now they're like, ready, like, let's go, let's play, let's do this. And you can see it if you know anybody who's in that three to six age range, like they're just so excited to go 
go out and, and, and try all of this new stuff that they're just now learning about. Okay, so I have another story for this one. My daughter who has autism, she took a little while to get through the preparatory stage. We had this um, vacuum, one of those play vacuums, right? And she would put it on the floor and she would jump on it when she was like three and four years old, right? She liked that. It's called vestibular motion. It kind of told her where she was in the world. Um, it's why you see a lot of people stemming or rocking similar behavior, right? But one day she was like probably like five or six. She picked up the vacuum and she started started some vacuuming motions with it and we were all so excited because it meant that she was developing her sense of self. She had learned what a vacuum was and she was starting to use it the way a vacuum was intended to be used, right? It was so exciting. A lot of times with kiddos we take these steps for granted because it's uh, happening so quickly and it almost seems natural, right? We like, that's just the way it is. All kids are this way. Um, but actually, it's, it's social. You're giving the children those toys so that they can play or pretend. You're teaching them all those words so that they know what all those objects are. It's not a natural phenomenon. It's a social one based on interaction, based on giving children the tools to do these things. That's why I know you guys have heard um, people criticize uh our education system because they don't let children play enough and play really is an essential step in becoming a well-rounded uh, adult individual. Okay, Holly, I have so much to say, right? You can tell I love sociology. What's the third stage in Mead's development of self? It is the game stage, usually about seven plus. So I'm still in the game stage, still trying to figure this shit out. You're still in the game stage, most likely, if you're watching this. It continues um, throughout your life. But we start to develop this really cool ability about around age seven. And that really cool ability is called the generalized other. The generalized other, this is kind of a tricky concept, so tune in with me for a second. The generalized other is our ability to anticipate how most people will behave in a given situation. We're going to play a game in, in our um, Zoom meeting to kind of illustrate this. But the idea is, is that we can kind of anticipate what people are going to do, and it makes us able to play games. Have you ever tried to play like tic-tac-toe with a toddler? It's ridiculous, right? Like, I, I always wind up like, I don't know if I should win or lose or what, but I have to tell them where to go or I have to just be like brutal and just beat them in like all the four steps that it takes or whatever, right? Like, I'm just like, Rrr. it's really hard because you're essentially playing with yourself because the toddler does not have a generalized other. They're not able to anticipate what you're going to do. And so they just, they're little egomaniacs, right? They just go wherever they want. They don't care about you at all. And so you have to do the work of the generalized other for both of you if you play a game like that, a game of strategy with a young person person. Okay, so generalized others are ability to anticipate what most people will do in a given situation. Now, the cool thing about that is once you have reached this stage and you're able to think about how other people behave in a given situation, that is the moment when you develop a sense of self. Because now you're not just a little egomaniac. You're not just out for yourself. You are a social human being. And you see other people. You reflect on that. You make choices about how you're going to behave in reaction to other people. You have have a self. So I love this about me, right? That you're not really who you're going to be until you can think about how other people will be in the world. Really cool theory, right? Okay, we'll play with it more in class. Thanks for hanging out with me. Bye, students.